Welcome to the Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Zafar Chowdhury. Dr. Chowdhury is Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Officer of Seattle Children's, providing vision and leadership for the development of technology initiatives and enterprise-wide information systems and services. His career began as a physician, and he has accumulated over 25 years of healthcare informatics experience, including roles at startups and academic institutions, as well as serving as CIO for prominent hospitals in the UK, such as Liverpool Women's and Cambridge University Hospitals, as well as the Research Director for Global Healthcare at Gautner. Dr. Chowdhury holds an MD from Ross University and advanced degrees, including Masters in Healthcare Management and Policy from UAB, a Master's in Information Systems Management from the University of Salford, and an MBA from Aston University. Dr. Chowdhury, Zafar, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's awesome having you on. You know, you've led such a unique career for the past 35 years that's really been centered around healthcare IT, but I know you started as an internist, so I'm really curious, you know, what drew you to pursue medicine in the first place? Well, I think it was a cultural thing. I think as I was growing up, I wasn't given much of a choice. It was either be a physician or be a dentist. And I thought, well, I don't know if I want to put my hands in people's mouths all my life. So there wasn't really any other option at the time in terms of options I was given by family. Makes sense. It's funny because as an internal medicine doc, I mean, you've maybe even put your hands in a patient's mouth in the past to, to diagnose what's going on. But... Yeah, I mean, technically, but do you want to do that day yeah, in, day yeah. out? I thought totally. maybe not. And then I also thought that, you know, if I can make it through medicine, then maybe my parents will allow me to do something else after that, which yeah. seemed to have worked out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, following your stint in internal medicine, you went on to pursue various roles in healthcare technology, and it Kind of seems like you haven't looked back ever since. I'm curious, what was the first kind of foray into the world of digital health and health IT? How did you get started there? Well, I think, and you know, not to age myself, although I may be aging myself, I'm of the era where clinical teams and people and staff didn't really participate in information technology. And I remember a discussion I had that said, hey, would you be interested in learning more about technology in healthcare. And I thought this might be a good idea. And this was the time when everything was green screen and you pretty much had to memorize keys to yeah. navigate systems. They were very basic systems back then. And you were recording information on floppy drives. <laughs> so I volunteered to learn more. And as I learned more, I came to the conclusion that this will probably take off, albeit it will take some time. And I sort of felt that as we moved towards a technological age, the power was in the technology, not necessarily in the practice of medicine. And I guess it was a gamble. The gamble paid off in the sense that now if you look at health and its connection to health IT, pretty much most healthcare organizations cannot function without functioning IT. Although it's taken many years to evolve to where we are, it's been nice to watch that journey evolve over time. And coming from that green screen era to where we are now, I feel like I'm always learning. You, you can never stop learning. It's hard though, because every time you think you know a technology, they do something completely different. <laughs> and then you're like, oh dear. It's like buying a phone. Right. Every few years I upgrade my phone and I think, oh dear, now I have to learn something else. And it's harder. And I always use the analogy that the average 11 year old knows a lot of, a lot more about technology than I do. Can I ask you over the years, do you find that your, that the size of your IT teams has dramatically increased, let's say in the past decade, and do you foresee that continuing? Yeah. So I think what I've seen is definitely more investment in health IT and even more reliance on health IT. So, you know, whereas many years ago, there was less than half a percent investment in technology. Now the average organization is spending yeah, about four and a half percent of their annual revenue technology. Some of the forward thinking ones are spending up to 6% of 
of their annual revenue and technology. And that's a large chunk. Right here at Seattle Children's, we spend about 5% of our revenue on technology. And yes, I think the teams have grown, but I think we may have plateaued. I think now as we look at healthcare and the cost of delivering healthcare and the drive to improve outcomes and the difficulty in getting the right levels of reimbursement to keep things running, lights on, doors open, I think that's seeing a sort of static point where organizations say, well, maybe we need to optimize our technology spend versus continuing to spend. And I think the U.S. healthcare system is unique in the sense that it has innovated a lot. Lots of money has been put into new technologies, but it hasn't necessarily translated into the best patient outcomes. And certainly when you look at reports from, let's say, the WHO, we spend the most on patients and have we're number 17 or 18 in terms of outcomes in the globe, whereas the French, the English, the Australians don't spend very much, but actually have some of the best outcomes. And that's the most important thing, right? Because if you look at a patient, I, as a patient going into a hospital, why do I go? I just want to get better, right? That'd be great that you give me three apps to track my care, but actually I just want to get well and maybe never use your app again, <laughs> right? That's the goal here. You know, it's interesting that you've actually had a very diverse career. So you've done digital health and health IT in the UK system. You're now doing it in the American system. And of course, the, there's difference probably in culture in medicine, healthcare, and even incentive structures for reimbursement. So I'm curious, from a digital health perspective, like what have you found to be the main differences between the UK and the US healthcare system? Well, I think the payment mechanism is one of the big differences. So typically, the UK has more or less one payer with a couple of private payers, whereas here there's so many different payers and then there's the federal government as well. But the, the largest difference is drive. So when you work in a publicly funded health system, the driving factors are very different. What gets the teams to work for such low pay? And it's pride. So what I see in the UK NHS is a massive level of pride. The whole country is very proud that they have a health system that has free at the point of care. Yes, of course it's taxed, but not everybody pays taxes. So whether you're employed or unemployed, you will have access to all kinds of primary care, emergency care, secondary care, tertiary care. So that's what drives people that I've seen in the health service in the UK. They're very proud of what they do. They're proud of their outcomes and they, they're very competitive, right? So they want to be as much as they can afford to, they want to be leaders in the space that they're in. And you see that certainly from the academic institutions in the UK, they're some of the best in the world. Here in the US, we're very capitalistic, right? So it's, the drive is very much about revenue. The drive is around title. Who can I be? How can I excel in my role? How can I climb that corporate ladder? So a lot of it is money centric. And that then has a different driver and different impact, right? It's not that there are many people who work for us, for example, in a mission-based organization, but at the same time, there's still that driver to succeed, which is different, I find, in publicly funded health system. It's fascinating because so we're actually, Alan and I are based out of Canada and, and Toronto. And so I think in many ways, we're kind of straddling both sides, although probably closer to the UK right. culture and, and medicine and healthcare. And, What's been interesting is that, you know, I would say before the pandemic, we saw a lot more adoption of digital health in, in the U.S. healthcare system because of the drive to use technology to improve outcomes because of the value-based care changes and the, the competition for patient market share really drove wanting to improve the consumer patient experience. Whereas in Canada, you know, it's primarily still fee for service, not much value-based care and no real competition for improving the consumer experience. And that when COVID happened and we had this huge backlog in patient care services and surgeries and as in many ways, a single payer for all of that backlog created a lot of urgency to actually use digital to improve the patient experience, to increase surgical throughput and same medicine, generally same way of delivering care. But to your point, the incentive structure totally changed how we adopted digital health, despite just being neighbors to neighboring countries. This fascinating for me. I'm curious. What do you think 
that the U.S. healthcare system can learn from maybe the U.K. system in terms of what's worked well for digital and IT? Anything come to mind? Well, I think a lot of it needs to be centered around what are the patient needs by patient population in, in your particular location, right? I don't necessarily think that we always engage that patient, parent, caregiver and ask them what they really need versus what we think they need. Because, you know, the U.S. healthcare system is loaded with super smart people and every health system is. And, you know, me as an IT professional, of course, I want to innovate and I want to do machine learning and AI and all the cool stuff that comes with my profession. But what I've learned over the last many years is that it's not really about what I want. It's really about what does the patient need and how will I know what the patient needs unless they go and ask the patient population. And I think if you build technology solutions to serve that need, A, you'll have better adoption and B, you'll spend less money. Because if you talk to a vendor, right, a vendor will always tell you they have the best technology since sliced bread, right? Why wouldn't they? They're not going to come and tell you don't buy our solution. But at the same time, does that solution fit with the use case? Or I like to say, well, what's the exam question? What problem are we really trying to solve with digital? And if you think about digital, I mean, it's like a running joke. What does digital really mean anymore? No, it's like digital transformation. What is digital transformation? Well, digital transformation is yesterday's continuous improvement, right? That's all it is. You can you put a sexy name on it. But the reality is not everybody needs an app. If I'm suffering from cancer, first thing I need is a great physician, fantastic nurses to care for me, and get me out of that condition. Yeah, then maybe when I go home and I need to take care of myself and I'm by myself, an app would work. An app would remind me to do wound care. An app would remind me to eat at the right time. An app would remind me to take my medication to go into my appointment. Yeah, and that would probably help because maybe I'm all by myself and I don't have that assistance. So therefore, an app would help that particular patient. But initially, what do patients really want? Access to care, right? So you mentioned that public funded health systems, Canadian, Australian, the UK, there's waiting lists. But guess what? There's waiting lists in the US. Try and get a primary care appointment in Seattle on the same day, you will never be, you will never manage that. Certainly my access to my own primary care doctor is a minimum of three weeks. If I was to try and get primary care appointment in the UK, it's same day. My folks could do healthcare a lot in the UK. As long as they call before 8 a.m. in the morning, they pretty much get seen the same day. And if they get seen the same day, then they usually get some sort of care which means they don't end up using the emergency room services, which is what we see certainly in the US, right? It's if I can't get access and I'm not feeling well, I'll try and run to an urgent aid. If they can't see me, I'll end up in the emergency room and I'll be using the emergency room as a primary care solution, right? So yeah, that's where digital will help, right? If I can have an app that can tell me where the next available appointment is and time and location, and I can press a few buttons and secure that, then maybe I won't go to the emergency room and rack up a huge bill, which I probably didn't need because they're going to tell me I have a flu or a cold or a sore throat or strep or possibly COVID, which is really you can't treat. You just have to take rest. And so that's where you can see the value of pieces of digital, but it's not universal, right? There isn't an app. There isn't, as far as, I, as far as I know, there isn't an app for Seattle that tells me the next available primary care appointment in this city. It doesn't because there's other complexities like, will they take my insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Will they get my medical records? Uh, so that's what needs to sort of shift, right? We, I think we really need to start shifting care by maybe using the digital tools to a more primary focus. Because you just need to see a doctor. Do you really need to see it in an expensive way? Probably not. 
Yeah, a lot of really great points. When you were mentioning actually talking to that cancer patient and understanding what is it that they actually need? What's their problem? Oh, it's, they need the care. They, and then digital is layered on top, maybe as an experiential component. But actually, so far early on as a healthcare CIO, I think you had a humbling experience doing just that, talking to a patient who had cancer. Could you share that story? Do you remember what story I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how do you forget a conversation when you become a CIO for the first time and you're summoned to a oncology unit? It's not a place, you know, that you want to go, but you go and then you talk to a patient. I remember this patient, a 14 year old kid who told me that I had ruined his life and I couldn't understand why. And then he explained to me that his father was a pilot and he was flying all over Europe and the Middle East, trying to pay the bills, keep the household running, couldn't always get back to base to come into the hospital to see his dying son. And because I hadn't enabled the internet in that unit correctly, couldn't use Skype at the time, right? Which was way back then the way to communicate if you wanted to make a call to someone and, and get some form of video as well, right? And that's a humbling moment because whereas I thought I was leading the pack because I had this big title and look at me, I've got this job, I'm in charge of IT. And then when a kid tells you, you're pretty much a failure because you haven't done something as simple as that, that really wakes you up. I think that was a wake up moment for me to say, that's probably the day I learned that title means nothing. It's all about how good you are at providing the services that really fit a function. And ever since then, I've pretty much lived my career in healthcare as don't care about my title. I have to earn my title every day by doing good work in the organizations that I work in. So needless to say, it was the same day that we enabled that internet connection. Unfortunately, he died, but at least I knew that I had provided some form of comfort within my power. I couldn't help clinically. I couldn't help. So that tells you a lot. Life is really short. And we probably learned this from the pandemic. doesn't matter how much power you have, how much of a title you have. doesn't matter whether you have an American Express black card. Life is really short. And when it ends, it ends. And so that's sort of my career motto is, do the right thing as much as you can. And every day I'm trying to prove that it's worth keeping me employed, right? It says, look at me, I've got 30 plus years in this space. So you should automatically think yeah. I know something about this field, right? So I would never take that approach. I think every day I learn something new, but that was probably the, the defining moment for me as to how to be and continue to be a CIO. So many amazing insights to unpack. I mean, just, just I'm going to repeat some stuff because I think for me, it helps me learn. So I think one the insight, Dr. Chaudhry, was this idea that, that the title is something that really it's an opportunity to be earned every day. I love that idea. You can't get complacent. You can't say, well, now I have the title. My job's done. No, no, no. Like the job just started <laughs> when you get the title. It has to be earned every day. I love that. The other thing that you're starting to remind me of was the importance of, you know, like we all talk about the fancy new tech and innovation, but to your point, making sure the foundational technology works and is functional is so critical. It reminds me how, you know, when the pandemic started and Zoom really took off, like, why did everyone love Zoom? Well, it was reliable. It was the one service that everyone felt the video worked, the connection worked. It wasn't about a bunch of fancy features. It was the reliability of it. And to your point, it's if your technology is reliable and it's foundationally correct for the team, like they're going to believe in your leadership in IT. If you bring in fancy stuff and half the foundation stuff doesn't work, like no one's going to care about the fancy stuff. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, you have to go back to the core basics, yeah. right? Just because I might make a speech at some conference to say I'm a leader in AI doesn't mean my clinical staff back home can even get access to a replacement laptop. Therefore, I'm not doing my job, right? My job is to first make sure that my customers, whether they're internal or external, get the core basic things that they need. Systems have to work. Systems need to be protected. Systems need to be accessible. Long before I do any cool digital stuff 
or write the next app or predict the next crisis in healthcare. I need to fix the core basics. And when I came here to Children's and I've been here just over five years, I wanted my team to measure the net promoter score, which is an industry standard, right? Is my customer base satisfied or dissatisfied with the basic services we provide? And when we first measured the net promoter score five years ago, it was minus 24. And the scale here is minus 100 to plus 100, right? That's embarrassing, right? I look at that and say, I may have just started, but I'm saying this department is failing because the doctors, nurses, and everybody else thinks we're doing a terrible job. We're not fixing the core basic thing. Now I'm pleased to say that we just did our net promoter score last week and it's plus 38. Yeah. Yeah. So that means we've done a lot of work to focus on the customer and delight the customer. That doesn't mean we don't do cool analytics. That doesn't mean, you know, we don't have data scientists and we haven't done dashboards and we haven't done the front door, digital front door application. We have done that too, but for me, that's the real test of a good IT function. Me as a doc, can I come in? How accessible are my systems? If my laptop breaks, if my PC breaks, if my printer isn't working, if my computer on wheels has got smoke coming out of it, how quickly will that be repaired? Will that compromise patient care? Because every minute a doctor or nurse doesn't have access to the patient information and the patient record is another minute we put that patient at risk. So at that point, it doesn't matter if you have a digital app, right? If I can't get, get to the data that I need. And so I've always run IT departments saying the first couple of years, I'm really going to have to dig deep and fix the messes, find out where all the bodies are buried and fix that. And then start to look at how we innovate, partner with the right vendors to come up with tools that will enhance that journey. But no point in having AI and a, a bot running in your org when the average fixed time for a laptop is four weeks. That's just horrible. Yeah. So leading a, a major pediatric hospital, I'm curious, do you find that your approach to digital is very, very different than when you were working in adult hospitals in the past? Like, like, what do you have to do differently leading the, the pediatrics piece? I think it can be harder in pediatrics because the external customer, the patient and the parent, well, put it this way, when you're treating a child, you're treating more than a child. You're treating their parents, their maternal grandparents, their paternal grandparents, their uncles and aunties. Everybody wants to be involved in that care, right? It's not as simple as an adult where you just tell the adult, this is what you have and this is how we're going to treat it. So the expectations at different levels are different. Like I said, the average 11 year old, well, they're, they're native in digital technology. The way I see kids use devices, I feel very inferior. I mean, I'm navigating my iPhone at a really slow pace. And then I watch these kids on units, you give them an iPad and the way their fingers move across the iPad is mind boggling, right? And I'm just still trying to think about what I need to do and they've already done it. CIOs today, certainly pediatrics, how do you keep up with that digital native? I think it's really, really hard. And I think I have a patient and parent advisory group, which meets every month and I've had one ever since I've been here, because that's my customer. And every time I meet with them, they blow my mind, right? I can't keep up with the expectation levels. And whereas I think, oh, I gave everybody an iPad at bedside, I think, wow, that's great. Mobility in healthcare. And the kids look at me like, really? I had that when I was five. <laughs> that's not really revolutionary. I was expecting something else. I was expecting virtual reality goggles that I can put on and live my life in the metaverse whilst I'm in hospital. And I'm like, really? <laughs> not, they're not wrong, but at the same time, I wouldn't have thought of that, right? And so one of the interesting projects that we're working on now is one of our docs created this hospital in Minecraft. <laughs> 
And one of the questions as I was talking to patients was, hey, why doesn't this hospital have Minecraft available across all the beds? Okay. And why can't we just interact as patients, 400 plus patients in, in inpatient beds in that virtual world? So we're partnering with Microsoft right now and it's in test mode to do exactly that. Wow. But I don't use my Minecraft, right? right? So when, when it was mentioned yeah. to me in various conversations, I had to go in and have a look at the platform and say, wow, people are spending a lot of time in this type of work, right? I probably wouldn't, but then I'm old, right? And I don't know what, I, I, you know, I get the whole concepts of metaverse, et cetera, but people are living second lives right. in, in there, right? And so every day, like, I feel like people have taught me something. So that's one of the cool projects that we're working on, which once it's all stabilized, we will launch that. We'll probably be first of type to do that. Yeah. Um, but it took a lot of my Gen Z employees to help me get there because I couldn't get there with my own thinking, yeah. right? So patients helped me. Then the people I put on this project, much younger than me, think differently than me, a native in that space. And they were immediately jumped on that to say, oh, this is a really good thing. Okay. We should really do this. Whilst I'm still scratching my head trying to figure out how is all this going to work? What does it mean? <laughs> so, yeah. You alluded to your earlier point around the foundational things are the most important first. Let's make sure that we have that well oiled. You're collecting NPS on that. You know, how is the internal and the external customers responding to the efforts that you're doing? And then, yeah, now we're layering on some of this newer, cooler tech that is confusing, uh, frankly. Like, I, I don't follow it either, the, the whole Minecraft yeah. thing, but yeah, I get it. You know, if I was a kid today, maybe that's what I would and want to be doing. What, that's what, you know, folks like Joshua need to, will be thinking about, right? As you create new tools for certain use cases, I'm sure a lot of your engineers and developers are of the Gen Z era. And the way they think, the way they design, the way they code isn't how I would do. You know, when I was doing basic at COBOL and, you know, JavaScript, which had a structure and was really hard to do, people are thinking so differently now. I mean, now you have AIs that can write code for you. It's just crazy, isn't it? And so you being at that leading edge of digital, you're going to have to develop and design and think even more differently than me. Because remember, I'm on the service provider space, so I could still be a little bit more antiquated. But for a vendor who's trying to focus just on this space, every day must be a really interesting challenge. Definitely. And and it makes you feel bad. I've never played Minecraft. I've never used Snapchat. I've never used TikTok. So we're, we're all in the same boat here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're all relying on the younger folks to educate us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe in the future, we need to add a Gen Z panelist to say, hey, hey you know, <laughs> with all these older folks who don't seem to get it, what do you think is that future of healthcare IT? Because that's really the generation that's going to drive the next level of innovation. It's not going to be me. I'm that old, but the newer folks are going to be the ones that really drive that thinking and what a what I would say the hospital experience looks like, well, right? It's so different than what I would have imagined and from where I came. I'm a physician of the late eighties and that was a very different era. Well, <laughs> but this is what it is now and what people expect. Now it was great when I could write paper notes, couldn't even read my own handwriting back then. And now everything is, you don't even have to type your notes now. Right. Now there's someone to help you called an assistant, a virtual assistant, right? So there's so many different things now. It's, it's hard to keep up. Mm. You know, one, one day we're all going to get a chip in our brains and you can just think the note and it will mm. document. Forget the scribe. Well, I think, you know, we're probably at that point already where we can embed an RFID chip in your arm. And that could actually be your access point to systems, rooms, different campuses. I think pretty much we could do that today, but I do agree with you. Yeah. What does the, this big push over the last couple of months on AI and intelligent AI versus 
just generic. It can think for itself. It can give you advice. It can write essays for you. It can do a bunch of things. That's a scary time. Reminds me of the Terminator movie. Is Skynet going to take over? Uh, be interesting to see. <laughs> yeah. I want to bring up one interesting point that you mentioned around, you know, being in pediatrics where you have such, you know, a, a young population of patients who are eager to adopt and try new technology. What's exciting is that what we see in the adult healthcare world kind of lag maybe the pediatrics world in terms of adoption of new innovative technology. So in some ways, the, the work that you're doing at Seattle Children's, let's say with the metaverse or VR or whatnot, whatever you end up figuring out, probably some of those lessons will end up bleeding into what we end up doing in the adult world. It's, I haven't really thought of that before, but you have such early adopters of technology and pediatrics. It's really the foundational like ecosystem for figuring out what's going to work in the adult world in some ways. That's actually pretty neat. Yeah, I agree. I don't think the adoption at the patient level is the problem. Although change is still an issue on the other side, right? So on the clinical side, support services side, adults don't like change and takes time to adopt change. We're absolutely right. If, you, if I give the next generation device to an 11, 12 year old, I pretty much guarantee that within the hour, they would have cracked what that device does. And they'll be using it natively, whereas I will probably take a week to learn how to use that device reluctantly. And I'm in tech, so I can only imagine if I wasn't in tech, what that learning curve would be. But yeah, you know, pediatrics is a good space to innovate and test out new technologies. And then even on the clinical side, right, a lot of the scientific breakthroughs start with pediatrics and then are retrofitted into adult medicine. The child is so resilient because it's constantly, even from an energetic level at a cellular level, changing, right? And growing. Right. And whereas we as adults tend to reach that point where we're not. So yeah, I think it's a great space. And I think technology vendors could do more in the pediatric space. Challenge obviously with testing new technologies in a pediatric hospital is always going to be the cost. So if we could get more support from technology vendors to try things at no cost, to prove concepts, then I think you could really drive even more technology, but we don't tend to always see that even proof of concepts tend to come with a cost. And therefore there's only a certain number of things you can pilot in the year based on current budget constraints, which we're seeing across all of healthcare. Yeah, certainly. When Oh, go ahead, Alan. I was just going to say it ties in really well with change management and getting adults, especially to change some of the processes that they've had in place. You mentioned in the past how roughly 20% of your job as a CIO is doing sales. And I was curious if yeah. you can unpack that for us and maybe help us understand what's your framework for going about this kind of sales initiative. Well, as I said, you know, in my career, pretty much Patients that could have to convince me that new technologies are needed and what they are. But when I am bringing in new solutions or even trying to get people to adopt older solutions, I say sales is my job because I have to manage change. So when I go and see different populations, whether it's physicians, nurses, allied health professionals, support staff, I'm the one who has to convince them that there is value in trying that new tool or that new technology, right? And I can't go and say, because of, I said so, because that doesn't work. So you, when you first are trying to showcase something new, you have to take time at so many different committees and forums and groups where you are educating the end user of what's coming and what value that brings. At that time, you see multiple skeptics in the room, right? Because they're like, oh, he's trying to sell a new version of sliced bread again. And then when you give it to people in their hands, then you have to be at the elbow, supporting that and still convincing the user that this is the tool that is going to help them. So that's why I always say 20% of the job is sales, because you're convincing people right? To do a particular thing. It's like buying a car. 
right? Cars don't sell themselves typically. Typically somebody shows you the tools and then you buy because you feel like that's something you need and maybe you don't need it, but you still, they'll sell you on the fact that you need it. And that's what happens in health IT on a day in, day out basis. It's like a physician who's had the same laptop for seven years and it breaks. It's very difficult to convince that person that they now need to take the latest model. Why? Because the buttons are in the different, are in different places. The screen doesn't look the same, but my icons aren't where I left them because it's a new machine, right? So you're spending time configuring, helping, training, educating, learning. And then the hope is at some point, 80% of the people you speak to will actually start to adopt. So I use the 80-20 rule. In healthcare IT sales, if I'm a salesperson, I have to convince 80% of the masses that this is the right thing or right tool or right software to use. And if that they agree, then I'm probably going to be successful. If I don't do that work up front, then that's when you have many software tools, devices that have never been adopted that have never been fully embedded in the uh, clinical community. So I always teach my team, that is your job to manage that change, to teach, to learn, to educate, to encourage. And it's going to take multiple tries. So just because I went to a committee and said, hey, this new tool is the right thing for our organization. <laughs> At that moment in time, 80% of the people are shaking their heads. <laughs> and then after 10 attempts at doing that, you start seeing a few nods after people touch and feel the technology, et cetera. And it's no different for patient groups, right? If I go to a patient group and say, I built the, the best digital front door app you can ever imagine because they can read your mind. They'll look at me like, really? How do you know? And so it's that constant battle. And it's no different than if you were a vendor selling a new technology to me, right? It, if Joshua comes to me and says, oh, look, we've created this new tool. My first reaction is going to be, oh, it's probably too expensive, right? It's not going to be, oh, I'm so welcoming. Please show me, <laughs> right? And then he's going to, him and his team and engineers and all these people are going to spend hours and days and weeks trying to show me why this really is something that will benefit my org. And maybe after that multiple attempts or what they call you know, a 12 month sales cycle, I might finally see the light and try to then bring it into my hall. So it works both ways, right? Oh, I, I'm curious. I'm sure there are times where the value to yourself and your team for, from a digital IT perspective may not match the value that frontline clinicians care about. So for example, you really care about cybersecurity, you know, now probably more than ever, but if you talk to physicians, they could care less about cybersecurity. So when you're bringing in something, let's say for cybersecurity, for example, but you know that solution is going to impact, let's say the workflow of a data clinician, like how do you make that pitch or do you have to find some other value proposition that they do care about in the solution? Like, how do you think about that? Well, cyber is an interesting one because I completely agree with what you said. So I'm passionate about it because I know the impact of it, whereas the individual user isn't passionate about it because they just want to do their job. So that becomes even a harder sales pitch, right? Because firstly, it is my responsibility as a technologist in healthcare to find a solution that is simple. There are too many solutions. We have so much technology sprawl that nobody wants to log into their device 17 times. They don't because every time you do, that's a minute lost from patient care. So firstly, my team has to find solutions that are easy to use with putting themselves in the shoes of that customer. Once we know we have something that's easy enough, because no, nothing's perfect, then you still have to go and convince the clinicians through education as to what the impact would be if we didn't use the tool. So cyber is where you have to come at this from the other side, i.e. if the clinical EMR was unavailable for the next day, 
what impact would that have on, on your clinical practice? Mm -hmm. Then it makes them think, well, I can't live without that system for a day. Then all of a sudden you work backwards with cyber and say, well, to prevent that from happening, nothing's perfect, right? In the cyber world, we really need you to let's say do two factor authentication, but we've made it simple because it'll pop up on your screen and you just have to press the yes button. That's all you have to do. But if you do that, we'll have another layer of protection, which means uptime on that system will remain as high as possible. Granted threats change every day. If you take that approach, then people start to see, okay, I think I could probably do that. And then, so I, you have to explain things at sort of eighth grade level. And when you're buying solutions, I would say to people, don't over-engineer a solution. Don't buy a solution because the vendor says it's amazing. Test it and make sure it is simple to use. Because there are some really complex solutions, which are amazing. But at the same time, every minute impacts the day, right? Interesting enough, logging in times, if they're about a minute and a doctor is logging in, what? 30, 40 times a day, different machines in different parts of the hospital. That's 40 minutes of non-productivity, right? That nobody can afford when everybody's burnt out in clinical medicine, right? So you have to find solutions. Hence why people use things like tap in, tap out, because that's quick and fast. And every 30 seconds you shame is another 20 minutes that is focused on patient care. I tend to look at time saved as to more time devoted to the patient. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that discussion with the clinical staff, they understand that because that's the oath they took. Right? That's the oath that good clinical people take, right? We do no harm and support the patient. They didn't come in into medicine for billing and then all that stuff. They documentation, they came in to take care of the patient. So with cyber, it's quite different, the sales model that you have to do internally because you have to come at it from what if the worst happened? Mm. What would you do? Versus if I'm bringing in new technology, that's different because I'm actually selling it from a perspective of the impact it would have on the patient, patient outcomes, patient experience. So it's more of a positive approach versus cyber. You have to come in with the negative. And because there's a lot of press where organizations and healthcare is a very highly targeted area in cyber, right? And there's value to stealing an identity through a patient to, through patient information. Then there's many examples of what happened when systems didn't work for days on end and how much that cost healthcare organizations. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you mentioned, Dr. Chowdhury, that I think speaks volumes about your focus on the staff experiences. You, know, you said, hey, yes, like this new tool will impact your workflow. We're not trying to hide that. But hey, you know what? We've really invested in making sure that we minimize that impact so that you know that we've cared and we've reduced the number of clicks or reduced the friction. And I think that's a very powerful message. It's not just, hey, like, here's a tool, deal with it. It's like, no, 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 we put a lot of thought into this. That's really powerful. Yeah, I do that because I'm of the web era, right? So the, when the internet, you know, sort of spun up and everybody used to talk about three clicks to get wherever you need to go. And I think we've moved away from that. Even if you look at some of the websites now and you're buying something, it's taking more than three clicks and it gets frustrating. But in clinical care, when time is of the essence and you need to get to that information, you still want to architect solutions in three clicks. It's no different than an app that you build, which you do build, right? The reality is, does your app get the patient to the information they need in three clicks or less, or is the authentication alone more than three clicks, oh. right? And then you're still not, and you're still searching and having developed many years ago, Palm pilot based apps, mm. if you don't know if you remember, you may not be old enough, oh. but that was the super sexy handheld device, right? And then you had the stylus and. You know, you'd built, you built everything on Python, HTML, and then you could navigate information 
quickly and everybody was like, look at me with my power pilot, you know. We've evolved from there, but sometimes they feel like we haven't because some of the apps that I see that are still being sold, especially when you go to big conferences, I'm like, really? That's a chunk of time for me to navigate that. And from a patient perspective, never build anything that requires you to hold a formal training class, yeah. <laughs> right? And some apps are like that. You're like, oh my God, we now have to have a 24 seven helpline to help you use the app. It's, it's like banking. You know, the banks have complicated their apps so much that people are always on the phone trying to find out how to transfer money, how to send a wire when before you just walk into the bank, fill a form in and they do it for you, right? And now you have to do everything yourself. And there isn't really a formal training class and you're constantly calling. That is a problem in healthcare too. You have to be very careful how you build it and then how that is supported. It's funny how for a lot of products, the people who build it, to them, it seems so obvious how to use the product because you're in the weeds every day, the use cases inside and out, but it's your baby. But to your point, when you put it in the hands of users, even very smart, smart you know, human beings, and they have no idea what to do. There's a problem there. To your point, like sometimes in healthcare, we don't get feedback early enough from patients, from providers. We don't truly co-design it, but with the complexity of health, it has to be important. It really has to be co-designed, right? I always recommend to software vendors that the minute you produce something, find the worst technology user in the healthcare system and you have them test it for you. Because they will very quickly list the 15 things that are wrong with this app that you've built. And then you can go and fix it. And that doesn't happen. So a lot of times people will launch something and don't get me wrong, there'll be 50 people on the vendor side, super smart, who 100% thought they got it right. And then they give it to somebody like me and I'm scratching my head thinking, how am I supposed to navigate this thing? How am I? And then and that's that dissatisfaction. So I always say to, to certainly software developers that if you do not have a panel of clinical users that you may compensate for an hour of their time to come in and test everything you do to, when you iterate your application, then you're losing you, you're failing because it'll bite you when it goes to production and then people start writing reviews that say, oh, this is really hard to use, blah, blah, blah. And, and then a lot of the web developers that face that, banks do that a lot. You log in one day to your bank and it's a completely different UI and they'll congratulate themselves because they redesigned that portfolio and you think, they didn't ask me because now I can't find the information, <laughs> right? So I think... I always say to people, hey, if you can afford it, get a nurse, a doctor, an allied health professional in a room, buy them lunch or dinner and say, could you test this? And they'll give you a whole list of things you need to tweak. I love it. Makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So Dr. Chowdhury, I wanted to ask you, we were talking about access earlier and how that's one of the main priorities always. And I know that you're big on equity as well. There was a program that you set up where you were loaning out devices. And I think this is so interesting because it again speaks to sometimes it's the low tech initiatives that make the most sense that actually solve the problems that patients and families are having. So what I think happened was you set up these kiosks all around the state for telemedicine capabilities if a patient didn't have the means at home, something like that. Could you share a little bit more about the initiative? Yeah, so I think the interesting thing is we sort of folks working in tech or wanting to tech, we're very lucky because we have access to devices. We, act, we have access to high-speed internet. And what we don't think of is the digital divide. So if you're a household that doesn't have a high income level and you have multiple kids, for example, so they may, you may have four kids, two adults in the household on a very low income. The likelihood that household will have four Apple MacBooks is very unlikely. They may have a smartphone, but it may be four versions behind and it's more than likely Android based. And then they might not even have internet access at home, especially in rural locations. So Washington has a lot of rural locations where you do not get one gigabit internet connectivity in your house 
Seattle, you might do, right? So we need to think about those patients and parents and consumers who don't have that access, who don't have the right version of device, who don't have the right security levels on their device, right? Because telemedicine really blew up in the pandemic. Everybody wanted to consume a telemedicine visit because they couldn't physically come into a facility, right? But what we didn't know at the time was all these patients who had laptops, some of them did, but their laptops are five years old and they hadn't got any antivirus on them or anything. So the huge risk of running these sessions on these devices, it's a risk. And so that's where we came up with, well, what is our patient population? And we may need to load them a device. So we did spin up a device loaner program, which is still in play. It is challenging because it's interesting that people do bring the device back, but you have to start off with maybe the device won't come back. And how many devices do you really have? How much can you afford to give out? So yeah, it's our regional clinics because we have 46 sites across four states. We did put in kiosks there. So you could drive to the clinic and in safety use the kiosk to consume a telemedicine visit. That was one option. The other option was we would lend you a device and the device would come with a dongle. So you had connectivity as well. Cause I couldn't make the assumption that you had decent connectivity. And you know, what's most interesting to me lessons from the pandemic is that even IT professionals who thought they had 200 meg connections at home struggled. Why? Why? Because now they have six people at home trying to use that connection at the same time in HD or 4K quality, and it wasn't working, right? You, you were getting lag and jitter and things were breaking up. It's not like our conversation today where I'm on a solid connection, you're on a solid connection. The voice hasn't the broken, the video hasn't broken, hopefully, through this conversation. But that was an assumption we made pre-pandemic, and I don't make that assumption anymore. I think every time I see a patient or someone who needs, even in my own teams or clinical staff, the first question I ask is, tell me your setup at home. How much do you, how much internet connectivity do you have? Do you buy all of that from the vendor or do you have devices on top of that? Because the other thing is people think that because I bought internet from company X, it's going to be amazing. Not necessarily, right? You could have a one gig connection into your house and the modem has one gig, and then you put really bad internet routing on top of that because you bought a $20 router off whatever website, and all of a sudden you can't get a video signal in different parts of your house. And funnily enough, many people during the pandemic that I spoke to had that exact same problem, but we then had to coach them as to how to change their environment at home to take advantage of the money they were actually paying. And we've also seen some value in, certainly at state level, where vendors have stepped up to the plate and offered low cost internet access for people on low income. The states pushed that and companies have supported that. That has certainly helped, but it hasn't helped in locations where there was no internet in the first place. And uh, Eastern Washington, a lot of farming communities, and therefore they don't necessarily have the best internet connections uh, as well. So it's all about equity. Right? The other thing that we thought think about is there's a diverse population that we serve and not everybody is technologically savvy. So you have to provide that level of support too. Just because you think you provide with a laptop and mouse, don't be surprised if some of the older generation think that you're talking into the mouse, like my parents would. They didn't realize you actually had to move the mouse. They thought you had to talk into it. <laughs> and that didn't do anything. So you've got to think of all those things, right? And then how are you including all the different communities that you serve in that process? And talking to communities is when you learn what the gaps are. So we learned the hard way through the pandemic that our assumptions were wrong. And I think even now, we are lucky that we can make assumptions. We have access to devices and, and everything else. But there's just so many people who don't even have access to the basics in our country. Healthcare being one of those, right? So 
if you don't have access to basic health care, and then comes in the social determinants of health, right? If you don't have the right food, the right diet, the right education, the right living environment, it's all going to impact your future. And it will all definitely impact your health. Those patients that don't eat well, and certainly kids in this country, many don't get an evening meal. They don't eat correctly, then they get ill. If you don't get people good education, they can't get a good job, then they can't feed their families correctly, then they get ill. So these are all things that we, I think is more holistic in terms of how you think about a pediatric patient. It's such a great point. And it goes back to one of your earlier concepts around, we can talk about all the fancy new tech and AI, but at the end of the day, if the basics aren't there, not just in, you know, with the clinical environment, but in the patient environment, you know, to your point, if they don't have access to high-speed internet or the technology literacy to understand how to use the basic technology, that access and understanding isn't there. All the fancy tech in the world isn't going to do anything because they can't even engage with the foundational pieces. So. That, that's such a, an amazing and important point. We got to get the basics right on both the clinician and the patient side of things before we can layer on all the other stuff. I love that. Yeah. You have to think about what what is worrying someone on a daily basis. So whereas you and I, we may be worrying about the next version of the iPhone we're going to buy, there are many families who are worrying about where the next meal is coming from. And if that meal doesn't come, there will be deficiencies. Deficiencies will lead to conditions in kids. They'll end up in hospital. They might not have cover for. Right. So I always say to people, you have to take a step back. I feel very blessed to be in the position that I'm in because I don't think about, I right. think about, oh, what next version of technology am I going to buy next week? A lot of people I know and interact with don't think about that. They think about how am I going to get to school today? Because yeah. I don't have money for the bus. Yeah. And that's in our country. Right. We're not talking about a third world country, right? Yeah. And so all of that impacts health in a way, which then puts pressure on the health system. And so when we build out tools, you're seeing a lot of digital tools focusing on those social determinants of health. Now. They're asking those questions about your meals and your diet and your home situation. And that's where we are lacking because we can't help. Right? It's really hard for us to build a viable food bank to help folks out, right? And so those are some of the unheard problems that may not be digitally based, but could be built into an app, right? Imagine an app where I say that I don't have an evening meal because I don't have access to the right food, and the app sends you a referral to a local food bank that they know is connected electronically and knows they have food tonight where you could go get it. That would be great, right? Because then I would go down there and I would go get my next meal. But right now I don't know in the city of Seattle where the next meal is available for someone who can't get access to a meal. Wouldn't it be great if that was built into my healthcare app? Right. Yeah. That's a great point. Now, Dr. Chowdhury, just being mindful of your time, let's flip over what we call the fast five lightning round. First question we have is what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Well, my favorite books are usually children's books. And I like the Winnie the Pooh series. Mm. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned mm. from books that were written a really long time ago that even as adults, we could maybe relearn. Mm. Kindness being one of them. Right. Courage. Pooh have always had courage. Courage being something we need right now from everybody to get through all the things that are being thrown at us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Question two, who is a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? Well, I don't know. If, I don't know if you're going to allow fictional characters, but I would love sure. to meet Darth, Darth Vader. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds ominous. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Question three, would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? I think I would like to have the ability to read people's minds because in healthcare, people think you can and mm -hmm. you really can't. So sometimes you're scratching your head saying, I really wish I knew what that person was thinking. So I'd be, my mind reading would be what I would prefer. I like that. Probably good for pediatrics too, for a really young child who maybe not. Exactly. Maybe, yeah. Mm. <laughs> totally. 
would be good for meeting Darth Vader as well, just to check Absolutely. where is he at in this encounter. <laughs> Question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? Thank you for the culture. I would say healthcare, even technologically, healthcare is probably 10 or 15 years behind everybody else. But the culture is still very antiquated. It's very hierarchical. That is insane to Gen Zs. So we struggle hiring Gen Zs and retaining them simply because of the fact that they come with these big wide eyes and big dreams and ideas, and then they get bogged down by committee. And then they realize I can't do this because they're not listening to me and I need to exit it. So we are still very committee centric, hierarchical. And I think that needs to change. Last question we have, if you could travel back in time, any event or moment, what would it be and why? I think if I could travel back in time, I would travel back to the 80s. I think the 80s has the best music and it was just a less stressful era. I love that. Well, awesome. Again, Safari, Dr. Chowdhury, being mindful of your time. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with our audience today. For folks listening, you can find Zafar on Twitter at Dr. Z Chowdhury. And that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient, hosted by Seamless MD. You can follow us on Twitter at Seamless MD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Dr. Chowdhury, again, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here.